All right, good morning, Los Angeles. I am excited to be with you guys. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? So, so like Greg said, my name is Dallin Harris. I'm with Skyhook Interactive. We are a high-performance WordPress development shop out in Phoenix. And uh, I love WordCamp. This is, this is a fantastic event, fantastic crowd. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, Skyhook started in 2008. Uh, we've, we've made just about every mistake in the book. And my sincere hope today is to share some value with each of you. So let me get a quick sense of the audience here. How many of you work for an agency? Well, actually, how many of you own an agency or are freelancing, kind of doing your own thing? How many of you work for someone else who does freelancing or runs an agency? And how many of you are not on the service side, but you're, you own a website of your own that you work on? OK, very good. Um, so like I said, I'm with Skyhook Interactive. We've, we've built over 500 websites in the time that we've been in business. Learned all sorts of things along the way. Lots of small business sites and things like that. And we've also you know, recently gotten into some, some higher end stuff as well. We did a, a website for the Super Bowl in 2015 on WordPress, uh, which was incredible. And like I said, just kind of learned Made every mistake in the book along the way and, and learned a lot of different things. Um, so what I want to talk today about is customer satisfaction and what we've learned about it. Uh, big shout out to, to Chris who spoke previously on the stage. Uh, a lot of similar content in this talk as well, but we'll, uh, we'll add some nuance and hopefully add some value for you. Um, I don't know very many of you, and yet I do. Your story is my story. We started Skyhook in 2008. And we, we just learned so many things along the way. And so what I want more than anything is to share with you some of what I've learned along the way. And uh, my hope is that you'll be able to go and have happy customers as a result of this, and also just make lots and lots of American dollars, which is another thing that I desire for each and every one of you. Because WordPress is cool. And we need more of this in the world. And I want to empower you to be able to do that sustainably and, and uh, in a powerful way. So. Um, Quick, uh, one more quick note before we jump in. This presentation is actually the brainchild of my business partner, John Goff, who's a phenomenal uh, graphic designer, phenomenal business person. And uh, he was not able to be here today, so I'm filling in in his stead. His story is my story, so uh, we have a lot in common. But I just uh, look him up as well, because his, his content is amazing. So we're going to go over why sat customer satisfaction is important. We're going to go over kind of what Skyhook's journey was and what we learned in the process. And then I'll give you some, some actionable things that I hope you can take and do in your business as well. So what I want you to take away from this, uh, and, and really the thesis of the whole presentation today is this. Individuals, teams, organizations that you work with, they all have goals. They all have something that they're trying to accomplish. Maybe they know what that is, and maybe they've stated it. Maybe they haven't quite yet. Uh, and there's underlying reasons for those goals. But you know, and this is kind of like back to basics. But I promise you that if, if you don't learn this, this basic thing, it, you, you will never make money at this. Uh, we add value, and we are rewarded for helping them to achieve those goals. Not the goals that we think they want, not, not the goals that they thought they wanted but didn't really want, but we've got to get to what is their goal, or, or what we call at Skyhook, what is their target. Um, so these are actual testimonials that we have received. Maybe you've received similar ones that make us feel good, right? Your team is smart and solutions oriented. Uh, you made it easy to answer all my boss's questions. You guys are awesome because you care about our clients in a way that no one else ever has. And uh, when we receive feedback like that, we are just elated. <laughs> and, uh, and am I right? I mean, that's, that's cloud nine. It's what it's all about. Not only do I know that the client's happy and I feel fulfilled in that way, but I know they're going to pay the bill and I know they're going to refer me to their friends. And that's, that's the dream, right? We've also had, as maybe some of you have had, uh, other feedback. It just doesn't pop. Uh, I'm frustrated because you guys keep missing my deadlines and I'm losing credibility with my team. Uh, or the big daddy, this is not what I paid for. And those uh, statements express really emotional frustration uh, that leave us feeling terrible about ourselves. <laughs> and uh, because, <laughs> because happiness is better than crying, uh, my goal today is to, to teach you some of the things that can help, help your customers be very happy and, and more importantly, willing to pay. Um, so story time uh, about Skyhook's journey through the valley of customer satisfaction. If you look, you start learning about this process of customer satisfaction, it's not, you don't go very far before you come across this phrase or this sentiment that the customer is always right. Has anyone heard that? Right? That's, that's a very common phrase. 
And uh, I don't know where it came from, but I would like to find that person and strangle them because <laughs> it's completely wrong, at least in, in the work that we do. When we first started going down this path, uh, we believed this, and we told our employees, yeah, the customer is always right. Uh, we even started, so at Skyhook we have what we call thematic goals, which is like for a period of time, this is the only thing the whole company is focusing on, and we had a thematic goal called customer delight. And we had everyone thinking about how can we make the customers happier, and how can we just put them over the moon, because we believe they'll give us referrals, and so on and so forth. And we told all our people, it doesn't matter you know, so much what it costs, just, just make sure the customer is happy. And we, we went down this rabbit hole. Um, this, this was basically our plan. Get some clients, blow their minds, something, something, and then we're going to make money, right? That was, that, was, that was our game plan, but it was that, that question mark, that number three, like how does this actually happen, uh, that, that got us into trouble. So, uh, like I said, it nearly sunk us. Uh, it ended up being a very expensive proposition because there's a simple uh, arithmetic problem we found out that when you have empowered employees, and looking for amazed customers, but you don't give them a direction for that, you end up not making any money. And uh, we've kind of come to the conclusion that, I, I don't know where this phrase came from, or I can't say for sure that it's not true in other contexts, but um, it seems to us that the only types of businesses that can get away with saying this are the ones that uh, can afford to give away their, their entire product uh, and, and still make margins. So we can prove this right here, right now, with all of you. Uh, I want you to raise your hand if you are a customer of anything, ever, okay? <laughs> so that's you. Now I want you to raise your hand if you are always, in all cases, right. <laughs> okay, we got a couple people. Um, but basically the Venn diagram looks like this. Group of people who are always right, group of people who are real people. Um, <laughs> So that, that's kind of what, what we found, and like I said, unless, unless it's burgers or something like that that you can just afford to give away the whole product, you really can't afford to play that game. At least in our business, our margins tend to be pretty thin, you know, 10, 15% at the end of the day. You start giving away free hours and working on the wrong thing, your, your margin evaporates very quickly. So uh, you may be thinking to yourself, well, what about customer amazement? Isn't it, isn't it important for customers to be over the moon excited? Well, yeah, it's important, but you've got to steer it in the right direction. So, so you've got to make sure that you're allocating uh, your resources and your energy in the places that are going to give them the most satisfaction. So we learned that just like in graphic design, uh, where the first rule is that customers are real people, it's the same in customer service. Uh, these are real people. These are not this, we, we tend to put the customers on this God status where it's like they can do no wrong and they know exactly what they want all the time. And we've got to back away from that a little bit. They're, they're real people. They may or may not know what they really want. They may have other factors, other things on their mind. They may not be able to articulate exactly what it is that they want. They're real people. That's the first rule. And the second rule is that you are not your customer. Okay? I want you to think about that a little bit. Again, this is a very common problem that we run into. We come in, and Chris called it art, and I love that. that you know, we come in thinking with our own set of uh, assumptions, our own set of thoughts about what the client actually wants, and we start building to that, to our own assumptions. And we don't realize they may just be different than us. They may not have the same design taste. They may have different goals, and we've got to understand that we, we are not them. Um, so how do we go about figuring out what they care about? Uh, this man, his name is Frederick Herzberg in the 60s, uh, did a bunch of research in a neighboring field, which was employee satisfaction. So not customer satisfaction, but employees. If I've got people working for me, I want to know what it is that makes them excited to work here. And uh, Herzberg did a bunch, of, a bunch of research on this, and he came up with a pretty unique and powerful uh, discovery. And that is, it sounds funny, but we'll, we'll dig into it here, that the opposite of satisfaction is not dissatisfaction. Okay, and let me, let me explain that. What Herzberg found is that there's actually two categories of things when it comes to satisfaction. There are things that he calls hygiene factors, the absence of which cause us to be dissatisfied, but the presence of which don't necessarily put us over the moon, right? And then there's these other sets of things called motivators that we don't really expect, but when they are there, tend to make us really, really happy. So uh, think about the, and, and well, let me say this. Our big discovery at Skyhook was that these, this two-factor theory doesn't just apply to employee satisfaction, but also to customers. So let's walk through this. Uh, think of your last airline trip, okay? And maybe you were fun, you were excited, the wind was rushing in your hair, it was exactly what you want, you thought you were paying for 
but there was someone else on the plane who was expecting something else and is now terrified <laughs> that <laughs> to be on this same plane ride, <laughs> right? And airlines are a perfect example of this because, <laughs> see the surprise look there. Um, poor cat. Um, Airlines are a good example of this because if you think about it, there are hygiene factors and there are satisfying factors. Hygiene factors, when riding on an airplane, did my bags arrive? Was the plane overly crowded? Did it leave on time? Did no one kick my seat? Did I land at my destination, right? I'm not going to give the airline a gold star because they got me to the destination they said I was going to end at when I got on the plane, right? That's just expected. I'm not going to thank anyone really for any of these things. They're, they're all just expected. Uh, but then there's this other group of things, satisfiers, maybe an above average snack, maybe an in-flight movie, maybe free Wi-Fi, things like this that I wasn't really expecting and I don't believe the airline has to provide to me, but when they do, uh, kind of gives, gives me that, that elated emotion, that exciting experience. Um, so I want you to think for a second about a great customer experience that you've had in the past and, and what was it that made it so great. Um, I'll, give, I'll give you a second to just think about that. Got it? So for me, uh, I'm a drone enthusiast. I like remote control quadcopters and things like that. I really only recently got into it. Um, but I, I bought my first kit to build a drone from a guy. And uh, it was a really cool experience. It was, it was affordably priced, but I wasn't so worried about that. This was my first drone. He sat down with me. He explained to me how everything worked. He showed me how to wire it up. He gave me a picture of it so that I could go and assemble it myself. He checked back in with me. And I recognized that I was just there to buy this part for, from him. He didn't have to do all this other stuff. And it didn't take him a lot of extra time. But that, that little extra mile made me super excited about it. And now anyone else who asks me, I refer, you know, go talk to Dave. Um, so for me, that was, that was a great customer experience. Uh, now I want you to think about a terrible customer experience that you've had. Um, and think about what was it that made it so awful. So again, for me, uh, I eat a lot at Chick-fil-A. It's right next to my office. It's convenient to just walk over there. And Chick-fil-A is ordinarily really a great experience, right? They've got the, the whole uh, my pleasure instead of saying you're welcome and like fun stuff like that. And may I refresh your beverage? And I'm like, why, yes, you may, as if I'm <laughs> dining at some, some fancy place. And so ordinarily, I really love Chick-fil-A. But there's one problem, and that is that they still employ teenagers. And uh, <laughs> I don't, it's like a gamble now anytime when I go and ask for my salad if it's going to actually include dressing or not. So I get it, I get it to go, I walk back to the office and I sit down and I'm like, oh, where's my frickin' dressing? Like, it just, it's not in there and I go, ah, teenagers, strike again, right? It's like, for all the niceness and all the, the excitement of the experience, like if you didn't put the salad dressing in, I'm going to almost have to throw this away. Like, it's just not, it's not the same. So, and if you notice, in those examples, more often than not, the things that make an experience terrible is an absence of a hygiene factor, and the things that make it great is, is the presence of a motivating factor. Um, so now let's take this to your business and, and, to, and to my business and think about what are the hygiene and satisfying factors for your clients. Uh, we wanted to answer this question, so we hired a market research firm, paid them several thousand dollars, to go out and start asking our clients, our past clients and, and potential clients, what is it that you look for in your web development firm and, and really try to get to the bottom of this. And we spent several thousand dollars on it and we got, frankly, the same answers we all probably could have come up with by sitting around here and just thinking about it a little bit. And that is, you know, the, the dis, this dissatisfiers or the, uh, the hygiene factors tend to be did they proactively communicate? You know, ask, ask any of your clients, why aren't you using your previous web developer again? And it'll be something like, oh, they never communicated with me when things were getting late. Uh, or it'll be, there were lots of bugs in it, right? Like it was, I was having to do all this QA for them. Um, things of that nature. Th these are, they sound basic, but it's just, it's what clients expect and we don't get a gold star for doing it. These are the hygiene factors. And then we dug a little bit deeper and we found, well, what is it that sends you over the moon. What, what is it that makes you excited about it? And we heard things like proactive communication, sitting down with me at the end of it to walk me through how it all works. Um, these sorts of things. It's interesting to note that not a, not a lot of our research came back saying that the work needed to be technically amazing. Like, oh, it was so cool how they used a custom post type to, you know, make, 
to make this database module work. It's like customers, they do care about that, but it's, it's surprising how much of this whole customer satisfaction thing actually has nothing to do with the work itself. And you know, we're at WordCamp, you're going to hear lots of sessions about how to do the actual work, and that's all great and important. But one of the, one of the things I want to get across to you is that it's really not everything or maybe even the focus of what you should be thinking about uh, with customer satisfaction. So um, we found some general patterns, uh, but I would also say we learned to listen to each of our customers for specific nuance, right? Some customers we found are just kind of that egomaniac, kind of like, I want to have my picture all over the thing and seem like I'm the biggest game in town. And OK, I understand what you're looking for. And then other customers, it's all about function, right? Like my office staff is spending hours inputting these forms and would like customers to be able to just do it themselves. And so listen to the nuance uh, with each of your individual customers. Um, I think you'll, you'll see patterns as you look and listen to those testimonials in the past. But, but yeah, like I said, nuance with each individual customer. Um, so again, you might be thinking to yourself, well, is, is Dallin saying that I should just do the bare minimum? No, well, no. <laughs> it, but it is an interesting place to start to say, what is the bare minimum? What is it that this client is really looking for at the end of the day? And what that allows you to do, if you're going to spend a little bit of extra time, to add it in a place that they actually care about, not just a place that you care about. And this goes the same if you're managing a team of people. Um, actually, I think it applies even more. We find that, or I found that when I was the one interfacing directly with the client, I was, I was really good or getting good at starting to pick up on this sort of stuff. Um, but then when I started letting others do it and managing others who were doing it, they would again start bringing in their own assumptions and their own uh, wishes for what this thing could actually become. So it's, it's important to keep uh, policies in place as well. So how do we actually do this? Step one is all about setting the target. Um, you must talk with the customer. And here's the step by step on how to do that. It's super easy. You just ask. In the first meeting and in every meeting with the client, what does success look like on this project? And we have to overcome that fear of, of over communicating. We have to ask it. And then we have to repeat back to them, OK, here's what I heard you say. Is that right? And nine times out of 10, there will be some nuance that they'll say, well, yeah, that's mostly it, but it's, it's really more this. And that nuance is super important um, as you try to set this target. Next step is to stay on target, OK? All targets are moving targets. And if you set the target at the beginning of, of the project and then just run with that, you're likely to get off course. So constantly throughout the project, you need to be, first of all, moving fast enough and being flexible enough to keep up. Um, and, but also talk with clients ahead of time about, OK, as the project changes, as this evolves, we're going to talk about this. And it's super awkward. It's super uncomfortable halfway into the project to be like, I understand what I think you want now. That's actually going to cost more money. And it's scope overage, and they feel like they're being nickel and dimed and all of that. You've got to get that out of the way. You've got to, if you're going to be successful in this business, you've got to overcome that. I tell clients right up front, we're going to talk about money early and often. This is, this is just how it works. We're providing service. You're providing value. Don't be surprised when we talk about that. In fact, we like to do ranges in the proposal more than fixed numbers, especially early on where there's a lot of uncertainty for a number of reasons. First of all, it makes the clients on their best behavior because they think to themselves, gee, if I'm in a pain in the butt, I'm going to get hit with you know, a bunch of scope overage. And I want to end up on the low end of this range, so I better be on my best behavior. Versus if you've just drawn a line in the sand and said, this is the price, they're going to constantly be trying to see how much more they can get in. Uh, for that dollar amount. Um, but, but constantly check in. Am I still on target? Is this still what you're expecting? And, and make adaptations as, as necessary. Uh, so then there's hitting the target. Um, and again, like I said, your work is technical, and that's important. But, but I want you to remember this, that your, your value to the customer lives in their mind. It's really what they think they got out of it, or what they feel that they got out of it that generates that euphoric customer feeling and also their willingness to pay. The best, two best times to ask your customer for money is when they're feeling gratitude or when they're in pain, right? And, and, and knowing that and knowing how to uh, work inside of their mind, super critical to hitting the target. So um, missing the target it happens to all of us. You're partway into a project, and you're starting to realize that Maybe this isn't exactly what 
The, the things that they're now saying to you are not the things that you thought they were saying at the beginning and you realize that you might be off target. Well, I can tell you what you shouldn't do is just keep working and pretend that this problem is going to fix itself because that like never, never happens in no cases, right? Um, I would encourage you to adopt a simple couplet. Stop, look, and listen, right? Just like you're about to walk into a street uh, and you might get hit by a car, stop and evaluate where you're at again. Even if the target was speed and they've got this deadline coming up next week and you feel like you need to keep moving, it's worth it to just stop for a second. Everyone on the team take a deep breath. Let's talk with the client and make sure we understand what the target is because we thought it was X and now we're getting the impression that it's Y and we need to reset expectations around that. So uh, that's, that's really kind of the gist of, of the content here, but I want to point out some additional nuance here that I think is important to remember. First of all, find out why. Uh, when you start to ask customers uh, what it is that makes success on a project, and they say something like, well, we have a trade show coming up next week and we need it done by then, and you start asking why, you may learn that this is actually a really, this actually happened to us a couple weeks ago. This is a big important thing for our CEO and it's the debut of this new brand and his credibility is on the line with his investors and with his community if this doesn't get up. It's like, okay, well that sounds a little more important than just we want to have it next Tuesday just because, right? So we find that by trying to drill into the why of their target, uh, we, can, we can get a better understanding of, of what exactly it is they're looking for. Maybe it's internal politics, you know, uh, someone's job's on the line or someone's being held responsible for results. Um, make sure you understand why. Second of all, set great expectations. Uh, I read a really great post by James Archer of Crowd Favorite that was talking about how life is all about expectations and he gave the example, uh, you know, you go to a mechanic and the mechanic says, your car will be done in 45 minutes and it ends up taking two hours, you're pissed. Right? But if the mechanic had just said, it's three hours, same exact time passes, and you come back, now you're elated. Like, expectations are everything. And he, he made a really good point that, that I want to share here, which is, uh, it's not checkers, it's chess. Right? You need to be willing to have a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation somewhere along the way, because your end goal is overall win and overall satisfaction. And if you have to make an uncomfortable call this early in the project to tell him, your deadline needs to be revised, that's okay, because we're in it for the long game. Uh, there's safety and over-communication. Again, can't stress this enough. Uh, if you only talk about it once and then forget about it, highly likely that it's either shifted or that you didn't understand it in the first place. There needs to be lots of communication between you and your client about what the target is, and there needs to be lots of communication internally with the team about what the target is. Um, and that, this is what that looks like. Last time we talked, we said, uh, the project was X, do you still feel that way or has, has that shifted? Um, empower yourself with directions. So again, this gets more complicated as you start to manage a team underneath you and you want, what you want more than anything is for your employees and your staff to internalize this as well. That they have a language for hit the target and they're asking, this happens at Skyhook now when we're sitting down on a project, they're asking me, you know, I've just sold it and they're, what, what is, now what is the target on this project? And that's fantastic because they're thinking about it. Um, David Baker, who's another phenomenal uh, marketing consultant, I, I highly recommend looking into him, uh, says, has this phrase he calls a profit-based management environment. Meaning, on everything that we talk about, we're constantly saying, now, what's the budget for this? And, and what's our margin going to be? And that feels kind of weird at first to like, let your employees in on that and to know how much you're charging, but it really helps a lot to add color to this what is the target when they say, you know, they want a they want a CPT, but you know, there's only eight hours for it. It's like, okay, well, obviously, it's not going to be the most complicated CPT in the world uh, if there's only eight hours for it. The the number goes a long ways to communicating <coughs> what the target is as well. So uh, that also keep in mind that there are very likely, almost certainly, multiple targets involved, and it's almost like a shooting gallery, right? Like, go for the highest value points first. You're not going to hit them all, but understand that this thing must happen and it's the highest point value. Let's, let's be sure and nail that and then with whatever time's left we'll start shooting some of the smaller targets as well. Um, so that's important. And just to kind of summarize here what the target cycle is, you watch, you listen, you ask, you start moving in that direction, you confirm that you're going in the right direction and then you repeat that process. And that is how uh, we have found that you make customers happy. Um, so that's it. Now go make them dance. <laughs> Thank you. So, questions? I think we've got a fair bit of time here. Okay. Okay, it seems to me that the place to set a lot of this stuff up is in the contract. 
Sure. And I personally don't do that. I don't have kill fees. I don't have certain things. So my problems exist in that sort of thing. Another big issue all the time for me is 70% of the time or more is them, not me. I don't get contact. Sure. Everything's slick. So can you take that much out? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. First of all, glad you brought up the contract point. I think one of the best things we've done at Skyhook over the years is every time we finish a project or every time something goes wrong, we go back and add a line to the upfront. It's a contract in the sense that it's binding, but more importantly, it's to establish an understanding. Uh, we go back and add that line to our initial contract. We've now got like 30 things that we go over at each and every beginning client meeting. And here's the thing, because you're here and you asked the question, I'd be happy to share that with all of you, our contract that we've learned over eight years of doing this. Um, my email will be on the next slide. Shoot me an email when we finish and I'll send you that and that'll give you a little bit of a jump start. To the other question about content, Absolutely right. This is like the number one thing that throws off the timeline of a project. Um, we've actually found, and we weren't writers in the beginning, but it was like such a pain all the time that for our own predictability, we really started offering, we started partnering with content writers to make that happen. So what that sounds like is, hey, Mr. Client, we've done a lot of these, and you don't, no offense, but you don't seem like the like sharpest writer in the world. Uh, how about you just let us handle that for you? We're gonna, our content writer's gonna come in, they're gonna interview you, they're gonna write up the initial draft of the content, you're still gonna get to review it. Like, it's not gonna be great, but it's gonna, it's gonna get you past that writer's block, that initial blank screen, and you know, we'll even go so far as to subsidize that cost a little bit and build project or cost into other areas of it, because we would far prefer they let us do the content writing, just so the whole project can become more predictable for everyone involved. So that's a really good question. <laughs> there's expectations on either side when, you have, when they're not met. But I, I found that most clients are a bit edgy about really, it's difficult really to get to the core expectations. They're not quite, have you got any tips about how you find what their true expectations are? That's a really good question. Um, I have found that there, it comes down to trust, right? They've got to be willing to open, especially when you start tar talking budget numbers and you say, what is our budget? What is your budget for this? That's, that's a question where if they don't trust, you know, that you're not just going to throw out, oh, 20,000 is your budget? Well, 19,000 is our price. You're, you know, <laughs> if, if, if there's trust established, then they're willing to be a lot more open. Um, as far as getting there, I think the upfront contract, again, is very helpful. When, when you come into the first client meeting and you're like, oh, let's see, where, where's my piece of paper? Okay, I'm ready. Uh, and it looks like it's the first meeting you've ever run and you're you know, scribbling stuff down and you're kind of all over the place. They kind of start, my experience is they kind of start to get this feeling like, does this guy or girl really know what they're doing here? And they start to kind of guard up that trust. Um, versus when you come in and you're like, here's how it works. We've built lots of these things. Here's our process. We're going to go through this. Here's our contract. So you can see we've done it before. They start to build that trust. Um, and then... You, <laughs> Most clients do. I would say if you get in a situation where a client just isn't opening up like that or isn't extending that trust, you might want to seriously consider if this is a project you want to go down because you now have a lot of risk built in for yourself. You may get lucky and you may make money on this project, but you need to ask yourself, like, is it worth the risk and am I making enough to justify what if this goes wrong? So there's absolutely, I believe there's a, a skill fit. like. They're, you know, Chris talked about, can I solve their pain? But I think there's also a cultural fit. It's like, do, <laughs> does this person like me? Do I like them? Are we connecting? Um, because, and I think you'll find this too, especially if you're new in this, there's no shortage of work out there. Tons of clients who need this kind of stuff. Um, it's, it, you, we really have the opportunity to be a little bit choosy about how we're going to work with. And if we're going to propel our company to the next level, we need to be a little bit choosy about who we work with. Thank you. Let's go over here. A go-to move for, like, in what way difficult? <laughs> and anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so the question was, do I have a go-to tactic when clients are being difficult? I find that vulnerability actually goes a really long way. So I'll say to the client, look, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that you're not maybe really happy with what we're doing here. Like, maybe we've done something to mess up. and, and uh, 
and I'm worried about that. I, I want to make this right for you. Can you help me understand what's going on here? Instead of you know, jumping right to the defensive and, and getting into this kind of shouting match, um, it's, it's hear what they're saying a little bit and express maybe even some fear or some vulnerability like, look, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be fair here. I want to be helpful and get this right for you. Um, you know, having things in writing is super helpful, but also not. I mean, I'm, I'm a believer, especially at the size of projects we're working with, like a binding contract, really, are you going to like go in front of a judge and do the whole small collections thing over like a $5,000 thing? Like, probably not. More important than the actual legal binding nature of the contract is that you had clear expectations and you had set them up front. And when that's not in place, when you didn't warn them about it and yet it became an issue, you kind of have to just take it in the ch on the chin once and Give, give them what they're asking for, and then remember next time not to let that happen again um, has been our experience. Burning bridges, almost never worth it. Real, you got to be really careful. you got to be really sure before you burn a bridge, for sure. For our specific industry or just the idea of it in general? Sure. So uh, there's two factors that, that go into whether a client's happy or not. There's, there's dissatisfiers, or, or excuse me, hygiene factors. Are, are you asking what the actual ones were? Yeah. Um, okay. So again, if you ask uh, any client in our industry, they will say, uh, answer the phone. Like I hear that one all the time. I just want someone who will answer the phone when I call, right? Like mind blower, but that's a thing. Um, deadlines is kind of it, but more important than deadlines is the communication about, like, hey, I understand stuff goes wrong, I just want to hear about it. And for some reason we think that uh, they, they assume that we're working and we're just going to keep working because we don't want to stop working to send them an email, that seems counterproductive when we're on a deadline, let's just keep working. Totally not the case, like you've got to just, whenever you have that thought, you've got to say, no, I am a communicator. I, I tell people where I'm at on things and you just have to tell them. So communication. Um, and then bug free was the other kind of like just table stakes. Nothing frustrates a client like getting it and having spelling errors or uh, you know, oh shoot, that doesn't load right, let me fix that. Like those kinds of things just really torpedo your credibility really fast. On the satisfier side of things, the motivator side, um, proactive communication when you call them and tell them where it's at so they don't have to follow up with you. Um, the training and the kind of service delivery around it. And then I would say after that, you know, depending on the client, the, the technical stuff can be cool. Like we put in this little animation effect so the menu fades in instead of just popping in or stuff like that. Um, but again, that's like lower, smaller target stuff. Uh, you want to focus on the big ones first. Yes, up here. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I, I, I'll just tell you honestly some, some things that I've seen. It, it's hilarious. Okay, the question was advice for the client side. So you, if you are the client and you're trying to buy something from someone else and you feel like they're not hearing your target, how do you, how do you communicate that to them? Did I get that right? Um, hilarious to me how you know, we had a client once come in and we're working on like a $40,000 website and they bought our dev team pizza, cost them like 20 bucks and like they are they were like the favorite client around the office for like I'm like seriously they gave us forty thousand dollars but like just showing up and like expressing some real genuine appreciation or like buying us pizza or something something to show that they appreciated our work I can't believe I was almost like mad I'm like why are you guys like over servicing this client now all they did was buy you pizza but like <laughs> but it's it's a real thing like you're, you're dealing with humans um, the what else would I say to clients um, I think if, if your developer isn't following these patterns of asking you and then repeating it back to you, I think you can ask for that. You could say, so I've just defined what I think my target is. Can you say it back to me to make sure I know that you know what I want? Um, I think that could work. Um, I think, well, okay, and here's, an, here's another thought. I, I'm a big believer in the screening phone call before a client relationship happens. So a lot of people, oh, you want a website? Let me come over. We'll talk for 90 minutes, and we'll get all into all the details, and then I'll give you a quote, right? That's kind of how it goes. Our approach at Skyhook is we start with a 15-minute call max. It's just a, let's explore this conceptually. It's probably not even going to work out, but before we both waste a bunch of time on this, let's, let's go over the basics. And so we start with that 15-minute call where I'm asking, 
kind of those basic questions that Chris talked about, like is there even a pain here we can solve? Does this person have budget? All of that. Um, and are they kind of a culture fit? And then I have some pre-scripted ways that I'll politely decline if I don't feel like it's going to be a fit. And I think the same thing has to happen on the buyer side. It's like, hey, before we go and spend 90 minutes with you as an agency, let's make sure we're even on the same page about this. And maybe you have that screening phone call with three or four different people uh, before you go and invest the time to build that relationship. Um, but I'll also say, you know, websites are incredibly intricate things. And it's not usually something that you can just download in a 30 second, you know, or even a 15 minute conversation. Like, get a web developer and stay with one that you can build a relationship for a long period of time because they need to get to know your business, they need to get to know your nuance, and each subsequent project that we redo with the same client gets better because we're, we're better at understanding each other's expectations and stuff like that. So am I understanding we're out of time? Okay. Um, I'm around in the hall if you need me. Uh, jot this down, uh, my email address, and that if you want that uh, contract that I talked about, send me an email, I'm happy to send it to you. We also send out periodic thought leadership content on what it's like running an agency and things that we've learned in business. So I'd be happy to send that to you as well. I'm also on Twitter, at Dallin Harris. And uh, the request from the conference is if you can go to wclax.reviews and, and leave us a review. That just helps my presentation get better for other audiences that I'll give it to. So with the the What's that? The yes, I'll send the slides as well. Yep. If you send an email. Yes, send me an email. Dallin at skyhookinteractive.com. I'll send you the slides. I'll send you the contract. And uh, if, if you're interested, we'll, we have other thought leader content as well. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.